All right, everyone, welcome to this uh, 5 p.m. session. I know you guys are super hyped to be here. Yay, the crowd goes wild. Great. Uh, I am here to talk about probably the least technical thing that's on here today, which is I'm here to talk about hype. I'm here to talk about cloud and what's true and what's false. Anyone here heard of cloud? No one has heard of cloud. That's unbelievable. All right. I'm um, supposed to say a little bit about myself. So my name is Mikkel. I am a uh, data scientist turned management consulting turned entrepreneur turned comic genius apparently with the picture. Um, and I build companies that use AI and big data to look at IT infrastructure and turn it completely inside out, rip it up, redesign it, simulate it in a cloud and all these things. And uh, that has given me some insights that I get to talk and share with you about. Uh, we've been doing this for the past three years, and this is one of the topics that we spend the most time talking to senior management at um, just basically everywhere that you guys work or would work or your clients work. This is a conversation we're having. I promise to share this disclaimer slide. I am sure you have all seen one of these before. Otherwise, I'll give you 10 seconds to read it. We're done. So cloud. Who was driving the conversation around cloud? Who came up with cloud? What is cloud? And why should we care? Uh, the conversation today is loud. It's really, really loud. And it's predominantly being driven out of a bookshop out in Seattle, and then by the good boys and girls over at Buzzwords or Us, or Gardeners we call them. And these guys like to drive this conversation around a cloud-first strategy. Some even call it cloud-only strategy. Amazon up in the corner says, you know, cloud adopters are one step ahead. Uh, I remember attending Gardner sessions back in 2011, and they basically said, if you're not using cloud, you're a dinosaur. Well, a, a lot of us here are, are still dinosaurs, but hey, we're around. Um, I would like to use this session to maybe bring a little bit of nuance to this discussion, maybe cut through some of the hype and cut through some of the perspectives that we see senior management have about cloud. And first of all, why does that matter? That matters because these are the decisions about where and how we're going to run IT in the future. These are not being made in IT right now. They're being made up at the senior executive level. And I think it's important for us to look at what they think and also give a little bit of feedback on what can we actually tell them. So just to define cloud, um, we are talking about infrastructure as a service here, software as a service, not so relevant for this platform as a service. We know all of these things. It's infrastructure that interests us. So why does that interest us here at VMworld? It does because what did VMworld launch for initial availability? They launched native VMware on AWS. Microsoft just launched general availability of Azure stack. So they effectively want you to spill the Azure cloud onto on-prem. And VMware wants you to spill on-prem onto AWS cloud and other clouds. Um, so this is where we're going to be talking, because this is the one where we don't start natively. We have VMs today. We want to consider moving them. So I want to share three so-called truths about cloud that we come across all the time. Number one, it will solve all my problems. Anyone heard that about cloud? No? No? I can get rid of all my IT staff. Anyone heard that? No? Oh, good. And cloud is much cheaper than on-premise. I mean, heck, it's only $13 an hour, right? How many hours in a month, anyone? Quickly? Right, that's a hard question. 744. So first of all, it will solve all my problems. When I talk to managers what their expectations of cloud are, it's this. This is their life in a cloud-first world. This is what they are expecting. This is what they're hoping for. This is what they feel they are being promised. Now, I could have reused this from a 15-year-old slide and said, what do managers expect from IT outsourcing? And effectively, it would have been the same thing. Um, only difference is, of course, now it's cloud. It's the same thing. We're considering the same thing. We want to get rid of all the hassle that is IT. We want to get rid of the complexity. We want to get rid of the decisions. Let's get rid of this. And what will cloud do for us? Well, I'd like to share with you one of my favorite quotes. It is the CFO of a major, major company. They run more than 10,000 VMs. And he is the decision maker on this company's future IT strategy. If you a chance to read that. For those on audio only, it says, it will take care of my technical debt. The cloud automatically updates Windows Server 2003 to 2016, including all the applications. 
anyone here of a cloud like that? No, right? We can laugh at this. We can think that's really ridiculous. The problem is he is the decision maker and he believes this. He truly believes the hype. Yes, I know that that's, I had that look. He truly believes this. This is their expectation because cloud is always updated, right? We don't have to do this. It, get, it gets done for us. I never have to listen to another, you know, we're out of support again because everything is always updated on the cloud. We have to engage in low level conversations with senior staff, senior managers, clients, what is cloud and what isn't. This, of course, we all know that's the reality of running in cloud. It's also the reality of outsourcing. Secondly, I can get rid of a lot of IT staff. All organizations are under some form of pressure to optimize costs. Also, IT staff are super annoying. We don't understand what they do. They speak, they say weird words. They have a lot of stickers on their computers. They're difficult to manage. I would like to get rid of them as much as possible. I know that's us. So this is the reality that they are hoping for. We're gonna send them packing. I'll be rid of it. No more hassle, no more problems. It's gonna be great. Now, why do they think that? I, sure, I think we've all seen this in some form or the other. You know, we have our current on-premise stack. We have to manage everything. For the uh, non-IT literate or IT organization literate of us, there are nine boxes. If we move to infrastructure as a service, there are still nine boxes, but we only have to have people in four of them. So, you know, that's 55% of the staff gone, right? So this is what they have seen. This is what they've heard when they go to vendor meetings. This is what's being talked about. Um, obviously, we know that there are quite a few more people up in the blue boxes still being managed by us. And more importantly, we know we still have to do the stuff in the gray boxes. There is no cloud today that automatically takes care of everything. I have still to meet the cloud that automatically, through intuition or you know, telepathic enablement, understands that you are going to want a server. So I still have to have someone manage which virtual servers I have. I still have to have someone provision those resources. Someone still has to make the decision what kind should it be only now I'm not choosing from I have VMware production, I have VMware not. I'm choosing from 182 different Amazon services. Which one is right for you? There is no good decision tree on that. I still have to have someone do that. I am not getting rid of my virtualization managers. It is true they do not have to update VMware, right? We, we don't have to do that anymore. That, that's great. How much time do they think they use updating VMware? I, I can tell you the way we gather this data is that we go out and log on as root and we extract some data from the database. If you haven't logged on in a year, then that password automatically resets and they have to go find it in some log file. Quite often we have to go looking for that password, right? This is not where they spend their time. It's true we don't have to run around putting up servers all the time, which I, I think IT managers still think is what we do most of the time, is we just run around, take things out of boxes, put them into racks, and then take them out again and move them around, and that's how it works. It's not, not really what we're doing. Um, storage, again, you may not have to create the actual storage volumes, but you have to assign them. You have to figure out what tier do you need. You have to configure them. You can no longer get more than 250 megabytes of throughput a second, which isn't very much. So you still have to do the RAID and everything else yourself. Only it's happening at the OS level. So we're not getting rid of the storage, guys. Uh, networking, funnily enough, it doesn't magically happen. We actually have to connect to the cloud, which means we need someone who worked that switch in the basement. We need someone to work the switches so that the lady can play on Facebook all day in the reception desk. We still need networking staff, and in the cloud, we still need to make everything talk to each other and talk to all the off-site services that exist. Those people are not going away. And yes, we will have fewer people managing our data centers, but most people have quite a few servers that aren't virtual. Why aren't they virtual? Because they literally cannot physically be virtual. Can they then move to cloud? Leading question, answer is no, they cannot move to cloud. So we're still gonna have that data center. Also, if we build it in the basement, we don't stop paying for it or depreciating it just because we're not using it, it's still there. So even though this is the expectation, when we look at what data says and we look at companies that go out and ask, so you guys run cloud, what are your expectations for staff? Then a lot of them say they're hiring. In fact, when 451 Research asked, said what are the reasons you're hiring, we're well, saying 
7.1% we're hiring because we're moving stuff out of the cloud. Other people said we need new skills. Because the interesting thing is, we still need IT staff. We just you know, can't use a dedicated server guy anymore. We need someone who understands cloud. Anyone try to hire a good cloud architect lately? They are not cheap and they are not abundant. So you will not get rid of staff. You will most often need more staff and you will need scarce staff that's super expensive to get. All of this, of course, is logic reasoning, which does not always apply in management. The thing that does, the thing that applies liberally, is money. And this is the big one that's hard to kill. Um, I think we've all heard that cloud is cheaper than on-premise. Last week I was at an event and Microsoft was touting that Azure could run an SAP instance for only four, you know, $700 for 40 hours. I'm like, that's great. Who only runs SAP for 40 hours? I don't know. That's still $13,000 a month, which is still, you know, $156,000 a year, which is something like $680,000 over four years for a server that has two CPUs and 512 gigabytes of memory. It is pricey stuff. In order to have a good conversation around the cost of cloud, we actually have to be able to measure what we're comparing against. This is where this starts getting complicated for people, and this is effectively what we do and spend our life doing, is that we actually go in and measure your current costs, not by looking at your general ledger and saying, huh, HPE, that sounds like servers, let's put that on a list, or, you know, Cisco, isn't that something that technologists use? Yes, let's put that on servers and then we'll, how many servers do you think you have? 500-ish, okay, we'll divide those two numbers and that's your cost, right? That's how we do benchmarking. Uh, what we do is we go actually out, log on to the vCenter databases, we take out information that allows us to identify what are the licenses being used, what is the hardware in there, what's the configurations, what are that server cost, what are the CPU costs, what are the memory costs at the time they were new back in 1998 when you bought it. We look at all this, we aggregate it all up, we're able to accurately measure what does it cost you to run each and every single host aggregate up to the cluster level per month across every single piece of, of cost space that you have in there. So now we actually have an image we haven't had before and that's important because if you want to convince someone that we are cheaper than cloud, we have to be able to show them what we cost, right? So that's one side of that equation. The other side, of course, is that now we know what we cost. How do we figure out what we would cost in cloud? Anyone ever try to figure out what their environment would cost to run an AWS or Azure? No? What do you guys do all day? And anyway, you can log on to websites and you can sit for each and every server and enter. I think I will need a server that has two CPUs and eight gigabytes of memory and this many disks and yada yada. And that gets boring real fast if you have 10,000 VMs. Um, so what you've done, of course, is the logical thing and build an AI engine that will go in and actually map on the basis of your over-provisioning, on the basis of the type of CPU running, everything else like that, and say, what is the cheapest possible thing you could run in cloud that would give you comparable performance? And when we do that, we're actually able to say, this is what this server costs on-premise, this is what this server costs in cloud, this is what all the servers cost on premise. This is what all the servers cost on cloud. And when you do that across more than 45,000 workloads, you end up with this. You end up with a picture where on premise costs are you know, about a third of cloud IaaS costs. Now that's interesting because this is not exactly what we're being told. What we're most often being told, of course, is that cloud is super cheap. Just turns out it's not. And for a no host of reasons, it's not. One of them is interesting. Of course, in the green one, we have the compute resources. And on premise, there's more than just the servers. There's the power, there's the rack, there's all the other things that are in the light blue and, and orange box that add into that. But the dark gray one is operating systems. So why are operating systems that much more expensive in cloud? Well, it's a licensing issue. When a cloud provider wants to sell you a server with an operating system on it, he has to rent that from Microsoft or SUSE or Red Hat. And those rental licenses that they can resell are between two and three times more expensive than the licenses you can buy. Also, you, use all, you lose all the fancy ways that you can use host licensing for databases, host licensing for multiple operating systems if you have more than 10 VMs running Windows on a machine, other things like that, that are smart. You don't have that option in cloud. And what's interesting thing is that Microsoft actually charges more for a Windows operating system in the cloud than, Azure, or than Amazon does. 
It's also interesting. But they literally cannot sell this much cheaper. At the same time, how many of you guys are you know, familiar with the structure of your VMware environment and something called over-provisioning? We have more vCPUs than we have physical threads. On average, we have between one and a half and two vCPUs per physical thread. What does nerddom like that matter? Because in the cloud, you pay for reserved threads. So you have no more than one vCPU per thread. Now, two is more than one, which in fact means you can utilize your cost base more than twice as efficiently. Now, these are interesting things that all drive the fact that cloud costs for VMs are substantially higher. Um, of course, this is more true where server density is high. If you have a central data center that you have all your production machines running in, that's likely to be, that would be the red box. That is likely to be much more cost effective than the comparable Azure or Amazon stack, simply because that is where you're doing your best work. If, on the other hand, you have a small old test environment that, you know, VMware doesn't care whether you're running this CPU license on a old, old, old CPU that runs one VM because you thought it was fun to test it, they charge the same as for those brand spanking new servers you have running, you know, a terabyte and a half of memory across 32 cores. The license fee is the same, right? So that's why our cost efficiency for sort of test clusters or off-site clusters is much lower. And there, in some cases, it would actually make sense to look to cloud. And the one out on the far left is a good example of that, where you actually have a small cluster that you need to have out there because there's latency. That's your Hong Kong office and your primary office is in you know, London. It's a long way to travel, but you know, both Amazon and, and, uh, and Microsoft have data centers out there that would make some sense. This is important to show management as well to say that this is a nuanced discussion. This is also where you remind them that they may be considering moving an application to cloud. Right? But on-premise cost does not occur at the application level. If I move one application to the cloud, I cannot shut down the infrastructure unless I've removed everything from that infrastructure. Which means now I just have the cloud cost for that application and the on-premise cost, which is you know, doubly expensive. And these are important dialogues to be able to have with management. Because right now, they're running around thinking cloud is going to solve all their problems. Cloud is going to let them get rid of all their staff. And they're going to spend a third of what they're doing today. Cloud is not cheap. And it's an important point to drive home. Cloud is not cheap. And just moving some things isn't going to rid of the on-premise cost as well. Right? So that's a super, super relevant thing to look at. And of course, it gives you a chargeback you can start looking at that because then you actually have the cost at the individual server level and you can compare that to the cloud. And again, this is where the uh, CFOs amongst us will scroll down and say, okay, where would this be? Ah, I see a saving right there. Let's move that. Well, again, this is where we have that dialogue. Just moving one server is not going to save you any money. Right. So what is true about cloud? It's here. It is the talk of the hour. It is what everyone is talking about. It is what people, senior management CIOs, are being hired and fired over. I had a client, uh, a big agency out of New York, and they were moving to cloud because they had a CIO be hired and given that order by the board, you must move everything to the cloud. Why? Because cloud is what we must move to. That is the depth of the understanding of why we are doing this. So cloud is here. It is our job to be able to have a nuanced dialogue around the relevant players about how we do this. And how do we have a nuanced dialogue? We ask our data. We show them not in hype that you know cloud is more expensive. They're not going to believe them. We're going to show them cloud is more expensive for us. We have looked at our data. We have compared our environment to the cloud. And this is where it's more expensive. This is where it's more cost effective. This is how we actually get a place at the table where those decisions are being made. So they're not being made by people who think that the cloud will automatically update every server you own to the latest operating system. So that's what's happening right now. All right, I want to leave some time for questions because if you say cloud is expensive, someone's going to throw something at you. So if anyone has any questions, um, you know, please come up and hit me. And uh, other than that, just enjoy the rest of your VMworld.